this ch- this technology is so accessible uh, right now like say chat gpt we all can access it which is this is very powerful like i was surprised my dad actually spent an entire day talking to chat gpt so <laughs> this is reached that much that you know your uh, people who are not always active on uh, these fronts are actually using this technology like same i am starting a new position i am like wondering about how many things i need to be trying to do and what should i be good at and like this is always a struggle with yourself uh, but but don't forget to enjoy uh, the part that you are doing because later you'll you'll look back and you'll only remember the parts that you had fun So hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast. Uh, I have with me Dr. Swirbi Goel today. Uh, she's an assistant professor at University of Pennsylvania. She got her PhD in computer science from UT Austin and prior to joining UPenn as an assistant professor, she was a postdoctoral researcher at Microsoft Research in New York City in the machine learning group. Uh, she has a research expertise in theoretical computer science and machine learning. with a particular focus on developing theoretical foundations for modern deep learning paradigms she is also a part of building the learning theory alliance community that organizes and conducts several events useful for researchers and students in their career we'll touch more on these topics in this conversation but um uh, thanks for being on the show uh, dr goel it's nice to have you thank you so much for inviting me and this is a great thing that you've been doing i really appreciate the efforts you're putting in thanks thanks uh so before we get started for people who might not know you like can you tell a bit about your background and your current research interests that you are uh, working on yeah for sure so you already gave a little bit of my introduction so i can give a even older introduction so i grew up in india i went to i did my undergrad in india in iit delhi and after that i moved to the us uh, to start my phd and this was Uh, in the year of 2015 and uh, deep learning i think the deep learning wave kicked off in around 2012 so this was like a super exciting uh, time where uh, you know you were seeing all these advances which now don't seem so big but you know at that time they were like huge leaps in uh, different areas so when i started my phd i was always interested in uh, math and i was interested in theoretical computer science and uh, i had taken courses in machine learning so that had always made me excited so i thought this was a perfect opportunity to get into this area of research which is uh, you know developing these theoretical foundations for this new paradigm uh, of deep learning uh, that has suddenly like revolutionized machine learning so that's what i started with and uh how what luck had with me my advisor was also interested in this uh, so we decided to start working in the space and since then uh, it's been now about more than seven and a half years so that i've been working in this space and the field has grown a lot uh, from a few researchers to now a lot of people working in this field and doing very exciting research um so that's been the background of how i got into uh, the space of uh, theory for deep learning more specifically uh, the viewpoint that i took uh, for my research was to try to understand uh, what this new function class of neural nets uh, really was so like taking a very learning theory perspective in which you uh, you take this function class and you try to understand when can you give guarantees of trying to uh, when you when you train your network uh, train your uh, model with this particular function class as your model what guarantees can you give what assumptions do you need to get any kind of guarantees that when you train on data that you see um, in you know the training data that you get you're going to actually perform well on unseen data that you might see in the future when you apply these models so i took this simple question and took very simple models starting with like uh, you know understanding even a one layer neural network and then going forward building on that and trying to understand uh, what guarantees we can get what new algorithms we can devise to get these guarantees so that was the focus of my research during my phd my research tastes and evol- have evolved over time and now i'm looking at various other uh, modern uh, machine learning paradigms like my, you might have heard of uh, which are really successful like the self supervised learning these transformer architectures like uh, uh, you've seen the success of uh, gpt3 and um, i mean i think everybody has access to chat gpt now uh, and uh, you know understanding why uh, this is why this has been so successful and why is chat chat gpt how are we able to achieve all these uh, great advances uh, is something that i've been really interested in uh, these days so a lot of my research has uh, move towards focusing on these modern architectures and these modern paradigms of learning and trying to understand uh why they work and why they fail and how can we improve them 
Yeah, I'm, I think I already have a few follow-up questions, but taking one uh, other one step back is most of the people when they get started or get interested about AI is the applications side of uh, AI, right? Like it can do something, it can predict something very nicely. And the other part is m much more what you're working on, right? Like the theory like dissecting why these deep learning models work, which to be honest, like at least from my perspective is like the kind of the boring part of uh, deep learning versus the applied. So I want to know what exactly appealed to you more about uh, the theoretical aspects rather than the applied ML, which is like, I think more than half of the industry or more than that is much more focused on applying to novel or innovative solutions. What made you uh, stick to the mathematical part, which most people get scared of by? <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think applications are amazing and they really excite me that this is the potential that this uh, tool has. And uh, it's amazing that people are every day coming up with new and new, uh, you know, modifications and which are achieving all these state of the art results in all these fields. And that is super exciting to me. Uh, what uh, motivated me is like, that is really great that all this is happening, but you also see that like many times these models are doing things that are completely unpredictable. Uh, they are behaving and making mistakes that, uh, you know, humans would not do, which is fine. I mean, these, these models are not supposed to behave like humans, but they have their own uh, failure modes and uh, we really do not understand uh, what, what is happening. Maybe it's not true now that we have a little bit more understanding than we did when I started out working in this space. So they felt like uh, these black box models that, you know, are doing great, but, uh, you know, why are they doing great? And that question like always bothered me that uh, I mean we have so much rich theory for all of the machine learning models that were used prior to this uh, there was like provable guarantees there were like all sorts of amazing beautiful theory results and somehow this new paradigm which was doing so well in practice had uh, very little theoretical uh, understanding though in the 80s there was a 80s and 90s there was a lot of work in understanding um, these neural networks when they were originally proposed but after that there was like a winter of that like nobody was actually uh, working on this and so that made me like okay I, I want to understand why they work for my own son like I want to understand why they are doing what they're doing. So that's what uh, inspired me. Of course, this is a very challenging thing because the practice is like so far ahead of uh, what theory can try to uh, address. But that that is like an exciting challenge that how can we find a theory that's very relevant that can actually help with practice instead of theory leading practice, maybe we can try and assist practice to make it better. Because there are still like so many things that we don't know. And if you want to use yeah. these models in like situations that are you know, where you re really require a certain level of performance and you need certain guarantees, we need to be able to get those guarantees. And they're like our, all the skills that we have in math is probably useful. And hopefully we can develop new tools to understand, uh, which will advance math as well. Yeah, yeah. And what would you say like helped you the most in building these kind of uh, uh, knowledge base for these kind of things? Because for me, like if I can add is like b b because of my bachelor's course that I did, uh, bachelor's degree that I did had little to contribute towards like uh, understanding deep learning models or machine learning models itself. It was only when I started my masters, which was much more focused on computer science. And I specifically tried my best to take courses that helped me like fundamentals of machine learning or statistical learning that helped me understand okay, like, let me try to create a back, back propagation on my hand, like using pen and paper. So what was for you? Because I believe even though after that knowledge, I, I don't feel like I know each and everything, like definitely not guarantees of how a model can converge. So what what were the things that you did that may, may not be a part of a textbook that helped you uh, get to these kind of knowledge base for theoretical yeah. models? Uh, that's a really good question. I think uh, machine learning as a field borrows a lot from different other fields, techniques and ideas, which is what makes it very exciting that everybody can work, you know, everybody can bring in their own ideas and add to this uh, field. So getting a full knowledge of this uh, space is obviously challenging. So when I started out working um, in this space, I had done one course on uh, machine learning in my undergrad. And I had done one topics course on uh, something related, like online learning, I guess that was the topic of that course. So I had some background in like understanding how we formulate these problems, what kind of uh, small, uh, I mean, little bit of proof solving of like how to get some guarantees in simpler models. So I had some background before I started. But of course, this was like this whole open space of, uh, you know, where should I start? What should I read? And I, I wasn't taking a formal course when I started my PhD in say learning theory, which is what a lot of my research was. And I'd never actually ended up taking a course in learning theory throughout my PhD. So a lot of it was like, uh, you know, starting to read uh, papers, uh, you know, I would start reading papers, I would realize I'm getting stuck at this. Uh, and then I'd be like, okay, how do I get information about this part? And then I would ask around or I would like search on my own and find like, this is a, this is the topic I'm missing. And there's like so many amazing resources of 
courses that people have been teaching. They've put up their lecture notes there. Now, now we have videos because everything was on Zoom for a while. At that time, there weren't that many videos. So reading lecture notes, uh, reading different kinds of uh, material um, and understanding this uh, was how I started building it. And slowly, slowly, you know, you realize like, this is where my knowledge stops and I, that's, that's how much I know and I need something more than that then I would spend time you know take time away and spend time trying to learn more and talk to other people around me you know we had reading groups in our um, during our PhD where I went and heard what other people were talking about learned some new skills and trying to adapt from one uh, here to there uh, one thing one principle that I always followed was like to look at the problem from like as basic as you can so like use the tools that you that are the most basic tools and try to build it up and you know where you stop uh you you're like okay now i can't go forward then add add that knowledge that uh, that is missing so look and search for that uh so that's how i did this um apart from um these by doing this by myself i also had a lot of support from my advisor who was very willing to you know share resources tell me like what are important things to read because suddenly if you you were like seeing thousand papers and you're like how do i even figure out how to read this right so he gave me a lot of uh pointers uh other other people uh in my field my peers also gave me a lot of pointers and uh, attending conferences uh workshops all these things all added up to build this knowledge and still i would say i have um, a specific sphere of knowledge. I don't really have all of the knowledge and I'm still building it. Uh, so yeah, this is always a growing journey. Yeah, no, I, I love that. I think just to add on to that is like, it, it makes sense. Like what you said, like doing an iterative journey, like when you figure out where you were stuck at and try to get as many resources and information and then trying to build up a step base. And this is something very much parallel to what my professor once said to me. She has a background in mechanical and industrial engineering. And at the end, now she has joined appointments with uh, deep learning uh, as a like computer science department and radiology. So that's like a completely different pivot of like engineering. Uh, I would say, and I asked her once, why did you like, how did we end up doing like this? So it was more like back in 2013, when she was writing grants, she tried to focus her work towards like AI based, applied based um, research and then by st step by step collaborating with other people understanding their papers like their results it made more sense to her so yeah i mean i i i, I love that idea it's like more like identifying the problems and um researching more about it would be the way forward rather than taking uh courses like courses can definitely help but these kind of actual hand getting hands dirty phase is very important to learn yeah anyway. yeah and courses are actually very very important like i probably forgot to mention this but like i did take courses that were not machine learning like i took this course on randomized algorithms where i learned a lot of uh concentration inequalities for instance which have been very useful like I, at that point i didn't think they would be useful for my research <laughs> But I was so glad that I took that course. So sometimes, you know, taking all these other courses, getting your mind out of the techniques that you're used to and seeing some new techniques actually expands the toolkit that you have. So it's actually really important to take these uh, courses as well. Uh, you know, when you can't fill the gaps with your own research, it's good to just take the course because there are so many courses available and every university yeah. offers so much. Yeah. And you also did mention about something that is like, I'm personally very curious, like you did mention that still today, we are still learning more about like theoretical aspects of deep learning, as in which parts of the whole architecture when we have an end to end deep learning model, some parts are still like a magical, I would say, like, as in they work well, uh, we know it's working well, but we are not very confident why is it working so well. So what kind of things that you would say are currently a quite big question mark, even though based on whatever literature we have out there versus what were the kind of things that you already know were proved some time back and now we know how these things are converging from a theoretical aspect of it so can you give the audience an idea of like what does these fields when they focus on theoretical getting theoretical guarantees what does it mean to us as researchers or the outside world yeah, so there are many, many uh, instances of problems that, you know, the, when you see these models, you train them, you observe some phenomena that is like really fascinating, that's pretty unique to these models that maybe did not exist before, or sometimes it did exist before, but you uh, probably hear appearing again here as an interesting fact. So we can take an example, like maybe uh, this is not directly re related to my research, but like, for instance, uh, uh, optimization trajectories uh, of um, uh, these deep learning models. So we train them using these uh, methods, like which are first order gradient methods methods like you do gradient descent uh, stochastic gradient descent so you're doing like local improvements uh, every time uh, on to try to find the good of global solution that is going to be good on the model and this is a very highly non-convex problem very complicated problem that landscape that you're trying to optimize and somehow uh, these simple algorithms uh, work really well and they work really well in practice and this was a baffling question for uh, theorists that like you know when then landscapes are nice that the problem is like very convex and very uh, 
very simple, then it's very easy for these algorithms to work. But why should they work in these more complex settings? And, and there are many other caveats, like these models are bigger than the training data set size, which is this over-parameterized uh, regime. And there you should just completely overfit, but you're still doing well. So these kind of questions uh, were questions that we had no handle on when we uh, started. We did in... To be fair, like there were like this this kind of phenomena did occur in previous uh, model machine learning models outside of deep learning, but in the deep learning space, we didn't really know how this was happening. So in the last um, uh, many years, a lot of researchers in the field have come up with the possible hypothesis and proved uh, in uh, se uh, several settings that you know there are many reasons why this happens. Uh, there is something called implicit regularization, which means that somehow these models, the way they're trained, they implicitly, uh, you know, control the capacity of the model that they make it, um, you know, not as rich as it looks, but like it searches in a very small space, which has good solutions. So they're able to get a handle of, uh, you know, prove this for uh, some simple settings. And maybe like, you know, these ideas actually transfer when you see, um, they create like these di diagnostic tools that if you test this out, this, maybe this is the right hypothesis. So, so these kind of ideas we know now more, but still we don't really, uh, with like the models getting bigger and bigger and more complex and doing things that are hard to understand, like imagine chat GPT, like trying to prove why chat GPT works is a very um, uh, monstrous task, right? So we we have handled on many ideas, but there is also with everything we get a new idea of there's something new baffling that comes up that we don't understand. So there's always there's a lot of questions, but I'm there's a lot of progress also. Yeah. Yeah. So I think we already did mention in the whole chat is like transformer models, right? So I think in the last couple of years, or I would even more than that, I would say at least in the language domain, transformers have dominated. And even in vision, like in the last few years, like it has been the favorite child, like people are preferring transformers at some point or over CNN based models for vision tasks. So can you comment more about like, are there any, like, have you in, in your, uh, any of the research works that you have done, try to investigate these two different architectures. Are there any architectural aha moments that make transformers really successful over CNNs and even out of vision tasks? Like they have been very nice for language-based models itself. So what makes, like, what is the nice thing that you have noticed about transformer that make it so much um, preferable by researchers and industry? Uh, yeah, so this is a complicated question to ask that what is uh, exactly pinpoint, like what is the preferable thing, but like one thing that I found very fascinating and some something that I've researched on is a, that they are a different, very different paradigm uh, of uh, how you connect things compared to like convolution uh, neural networks or fully connected neural networks. Here there is like this uh, dynamic nature where uh, this thing called self-attention, uh, where a particular part of the uh, part of the input can decide what it needs to uh, focus on. So, like uh, this is called self attention, where I can decide, like this part of the image can decide that it needs to attend to this other part of the image, and this is dynamic depending on what the input is. So, and this this is a very powerful tool because, like, for many many maybe like for different tasks, you need different uh, parts that need to focus on different parts. So, this part uh, called self attention is like one of the biggest innovations and. Uh, other there are many other architecture inno innovations that have come up that have made this idea actually be successful, and uh, I think that is one core thing that I have spent time understanding that what is uh, what is new that this model gives us, uh, this this kind of paradigm of computation instead of like having a fixed convolution uh, structure and connecting them uh, together here you're allowing. Uh, this to have different weights um, on different parts of the image instead of uh, the same weight. Yeah, so that that has been uh, something that has been a new innovation. And then, uh, of course, uh, scaling them up has, you know, generated all these emergent phenomena that uh, you wouldn't see in small models, uh, you see in big models or with larger training time that you see that they suddenly can do reasoning tasks, things that you didn't actually train them for, they're able to do these uh, things. That's a very fascinating feature of, this is uh, of transformer architectures itself. Um, why why they are preferred is because they are very successful, right? Uh, you you try you try out like this is some idea that uh, somebody came up. It's a very very principled idea of uh, generating these attention uh, models, and it really worked well, and it gave a big boost, and uh, that's why it's of interest. And not to say that this is the only model. Like uh, people are coming up with all kinds of new architectures, which are modifications of these transform architectures. They are using ideas of previous architectures and coming up with new solutions. So we don't know if this is the final model, right? Like there could be a, a newer model, which has a new uh, clever idea uh, that uh, improves this. Uh, yeah, so that's what I would say. Uh, one thing I would point out, like, so I know more, more on the language side than the vision side. So uh, vision is something that I, I have not explored that much with. 
but uh, they're pretty unconventional compared to like traditional language uh, models that we used to have, which were like recurrent uh, RNNs or LSTMs, because they were sequence to sequence models where uh, you would take the whatever input you had, you had some history, and then you would apply the next input and you would process it so forth. So they were like, you know, over the sequence, they were operating in a recurrent fashion, whereas these transformers are like taking the entire input together and just having a few layers and simultaneously processing this. And that makes it very fast to train compared to uh, the other models. But uh, you're losing this recurrent structure, but still they're able to do these, uh, you know, learn these long range dependencies, understand like say uh, in something that if I'm trying to write like a huge block of text, I need to understand what I meant, like maybe 50 or 60 words before and it's able to capture that. So that's something uh, that this architecture is really able to do well. Yeah, yeah. Just to add to that, I think uh, I did try a few of the transformer models. One of the only limitations I think compared to what CNNs they have is even with a smaller or limited data set, CNNs are able to perform better, at least the REST NextNet, uh, REST Next uh, models and all those kind of models that can model these uh, residual networks based model versus transformers give has the given idea that you need a big data set enough to make it train very nicely. Of course, once you have a bigger data set, it can provide some magical insights into the model or whatever downstream task you are targeting at. And one interesting thing that I other um, found out, that which something not I have worked on, but I know the baselines because I have used the same data sets. And hence, uh, what they proved in one of those ideas is the idea of transfer, uh, transferability. So mm -hmm. if you have a pre-trained model that is trained on a big network, or sorry, big data set, you can fine tune it very nicely to your downstream tasks, which was previously given the rank to CNN models. But nowadays, like, and, and this is like the imaginate moment for medical tasks, at least, because we don't have a big data set. But let's say if someone has, and if they put up a pre-trained model, it can solve a lot of things. So I was like, personally, very curious about the idea of what makes transformer architecture really good at transferring these knowledges. Because we already know the limitations of CNN models um, label smoothing and all those kind of things don't help you uh, in, in in getting these downstream tasks really accurate. But um, I will, I'm like, personally, like, this would be something I maybe hopefully can do it as a part of my PhD is understanding what makes it so much uh, nice. So yeah, yeah, it's, it's even surprising that uh, in context learning, like not even fine tuning, if I add, uh, you know, I add some examples in my uh, in context, like in, in the lines. So like, say I say that I've already taken a trained uh, large language model, and I uh, just put it as an input, I give it an example of some problem, and I ask it to solve it, I'm not training it again. But it is able to solve this by seeing only a few examples of this, right. So it's able to even learn uh, in that form without fine tuning. And this is great, because I guess there's some part of the network that is storing all this information. And when we uh, give it some input, it kind of decides where to focus it on. And now it can like use that to predict and understanding this is a great thing, because this is very powerful. Because you don't even need to retrain your model. You can just, uh, you know, give it the right prompt and it will generate you the answer you want. And uh, yeah, there's been a lot of interesting work trying to play around with this and see what the limitations are, what they're able to do. And um, yeah, it's very exciting. Like the viewpoint that I have taken in my research with my collaborators, my wonderful collaborators, is that, uh, you know, understanding these very, very large language models with the capacity that we have as researchers and the compute we have, it becomes pretty challenging. So we try to, uh, you know, condense out like what are the things that it's able to do, like, you know, some kind of, uh, say if it's able to do reasoning, how is it able to do reasoning? Like what, what does it need to do uh, for reasoning and try to model that as a synthetic uh, task, like look at a very simple problem and see if it can solve that simple problem, which would also require uh, reasoning and train these models on these smaller synthetic uh, data says that you can generate as many samples as you want because they're like synthetic and you can train uh, smaller, more, more concise architectures and see how they perform and maybe use that as a diagnostic tool to understand like how they're able to do this and this can give us insights. So uh, that's like one of the directions that I've been looking at and a, a bunch of people in this space have been looking at um, where we can use, uh, you know, use, use uh, tasks that we know how to solve, but uh, you see how transformers solve them and maybe they come up with like interesting solutions how how do they learn these solutions and try to get some theory around that yeah but a, a curious question um this is I, I'm, this is going to be a very highly opinionated question but uh, i was recently like i recently invited a professor kambampati who's like a very well known person who works in planning and symbolic ai and he mentioned this very very nice thing that computer science increasingly by day by day is becoming more like a natural science 
meaning there is a model out there it works well and now there is a whole community who is trying to debug like why does the model work well which is very contrary to what engineering disciplines normally do work like right like we have a system that works and then we improve it so that like it can we don't we never question like why why a database management system works like we know how these things retrieval works and all those kind of things do you ever wonder like the, like we have a like cnns when it came out it worked very well and then there was like at least 3 or 4 years trying to understand what it is doing well and how it is doing well and then it came like shap uh, uh, uh lime and gradient explainer and blah 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 stuff that can explain these uh saliency maps and a lot of techniques now we have transformers and there is a whole community trying to understand why do the transformers work do you ever find that very um you know like something on the wrong track or like do you feel that is a completely um fine way of pro proceeding with research yeah, I guess there's no right and wrong in research, right? That's like, it's unexpected. Uh, we are trying new things and what works can be from uh, this side or that side. So there is no guarantee. As long as we're making progress, it's good, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, definitely like it's changed around from what it was before, but uh, that's that's always exciting that if, if something is working really well, then, uh, you know, this is a challenge for us as, uh, you know, humans and researchers that something that we didn't expect to work really well, or we thought maybe we thought that this could work well, and it suddenly did really work well. Because uh, the scales are very different, right? Like we have so much data, we have so much compute, we've like really advanced on these two things. And maybe our understanding of these two things hasn't advanced at uh, the same level, right? Like that what, yeah. what uh, this actually entails, like having that much data fed into a model that can actually process that, like the entire of Wikipedia and all the uh, text that you have in the world like if it can process that like the kind of information the scale that it's running at is so huge uh, yeah. that it's, it's probably you know something we couldn't even fathom like maybe uh, 20 years ago that we would ever be able to uh, train these gigantic models so um, yeah so I think I think of this as an exciting thing uh, definitely the role of theory uh, always comes into question that what can theory provide here in this space uh, but, you know, if you actually understand the tools better, you can develop better and newer tools. Like, you know, this you can go back to any example in history where we, we, had, the, we had the technique first. Maybe we had fire, but we didn't know how to control fire. So we need to control yeah. fire or any kind of tool. Uh, so it's always, um, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a new challenge and it's it's pretty exciting. And we're all figuring this out, like how to... Uh, how to you know proceed and how to come up with uh, great ideas. The one thing to always note is that these models are doing well, but they have a lot of problems. And yeah. uh, we are seeing these problems surface in all kinds of uh, situations, right? So but when there are problems means there are challenges that we need to solve and we need to use all the tools that we have uh, to solve this. So I, I believe everybody should put in the effort from all kinds of different disciplines and hopefully all of us together can come up with some solution. Yeah, yeah. And, and and you did mention about the scale and gigantic models, right? So there has been a recent trend that everybody's noticing that instead, like that was a time at least in 2018 or so, uh, I would say like people would criticize if the models or data sets are being uh, used by a certain amount of computational complexity. They would report that in the last sections that, yeah, the, these were the computational power. But now does it seems like to be a trend, like, okay, big models, like that is the way forward. And people are trying to uh, make the parameters as big as possible because, of course, the performance is at the most important metric that we are trying to optimize for. So do you think like in terms of, because you have been working on the theoretical aspects of understanding how these deep models work. So in, in that case, uh, would you think that this trend has to be continued or would you think that there should be a way forward to building more efficient architectures? Or do you think that from a theoretical standpoint, more data means more parameterized models because we cannot condense all of this information into a very small parameter model. What does it make sense from a theoretical standpoint? Uh, yeah, so that's a really good question and it's a big debate that's uh, existing in our uh, in our community that whether scaling is the solution. Uh, it is obviously providing like really, uh, you know, uh, like I mentioned before, emergent behavior that when you keep scaling up, it is when you're training it to do only like say maybe next word prediction is starting to learn all these reasoning and all these world models, which is very exciting. But it does, it does seem like an unsustainable uh, way forward because uh, there's a limit to how fast we are going on our company compute and uh, how large we can make these models where, you know, now there's a divide that only certain parts of the uh, research community can actually, you know, even train these models. Now the industry and uh, research academia have this divide, like what kind of resources we have access to, there's only so much we can do. 
Uh, but it seems like, um, you know, there could be more efficient ways of doing this. Uh, this is the hope, right? Like this is a model we came up with. We trained, we threw a lot of data, we scaled it up. It is doing great behavior, but if we get a better understanding of it, maybe we can condense it to a smaller network or we can, we can develop, you know, better algorithms to train them that do not require these uh, huge, uh, huge uh, uh, models. Uh, another thing that is always a challenge is that, you know, right now, uh, all the with larger models also there's a lot of effort put into making uh, you know hardware really good for training these large models so designing new algorithms and designing new approaches requires to develop the hardware also to match the scale of uh, how well these are doing right now so this is all like um, a hope that eventually like i think there is there is definitely scope even from a theoretical perspective or any uh, practical perspective that you would hope that there are models that are not, uh, we don't need to keep scaling up uh, infinitely uh, to get better and better performance, but maybe we can have more uh, principled ways of uh, getting the performance that we want from smaller models. And maybe this this is a good way to like, right now, at least the bigger models, we are getting some idea of what is possible, right? And uh, we can hope to try to distill this uh, in a smaller model. And there's a lot of research, active research of uh, trying to figure this out. Uh, like you said, that maybe we have, if we have such uh, so much data, then we need uh, some way for the model to uh, be able to store all this data. So we need all this uh, big capacity, but maybe not. Maybe we know how like computer systems work. There's a memory unit, right? There's, you can store, you can have a way to access memory instead of like actually having to store everything. And uh, this is something that is true. Like there are, there are people who are working on this space to try to uh, figure out how to access memory instead of like having it stored in the network. Then there are many, many ideas. There are, there are a lot of ideas. And uh, let's see, hopefully, uh, you know, some of my ideas will also work in this space and <laughs> come up with more concise uh, uh, versions of these models. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's the hope. Yes. And you did mention about reasoning, uh, reasoning that has been possible using these large models. So can you briefly, like me being a very naive understand, like I understand reasoning from an AI model, just like as a layman person can understand, as in I should be able to understand why the model is giving me certain predictions and I'm able to reason why not this. So there are approaches like counterfactuals and other things that have been proposed that can maybe pseudo help you into understanding the model's predictions. So can you like briefly under like maybe explain what reasoning means when we say uh, in, in the context of deep learning model and how does, how do we approach this problem from a standpoint of theoretically understanding can deep learning can really reason these predictions? Yeah. So when I meant, uh, what I meant by reasoning was that the fact that, you know, if uh, we, with these large language models are, uh, if you give them a problem, which requires like multiple steps of reasoning to come up with a solution, like say, think of like, uh, you know, uh, when uh, you did like some entrance exam, you had a question that required like two, three steps for you to figure it out. So you reasoned that this is the statement, then you came up with one step and second step and so forth. So this is something that, that behavior that I was talking about, that these large language models are actually able to reason um, uh, to get their solution. So I think there are many instances of this. Uh, for example, like I think uh, Minerva is a compute the, is a is a version that's taught on uh, math problems, and it can actually solve many math problems. And it can, I forget which country it is, but maybe it's a Poland's entrance exam, and it does get uh, better than uh, a lot of humans' uh, performance, which is which is like you know these are tasks that you think are require reasoning, where uh, you know I need to reason and I need to go through a reasoning chain to come up with a solution. It's not just like I see an image and I want to see if this is a uh, this is a dog or not. Maybe that also requires some steps of reasoning, but uh, something like more uh, more complex stuff. So that's what something transformers are really good at. And uh, trying to understand how they're able to reason uh, is very useful um, because, uh, you know, maybe the, the reasoning doesn't look anything like how humans reason, uh, but yeah. there is some kind of reasoning in which it's coming up with a solution by doing these steps. Uh, so that is what I meant by uh, reasoning. So something that I have been looking at is like, um, you know, trying to, like I said before, looking at a synthetic uh, setup. So with, uh, with my collaborators, we looked at uh, this rich uh, uh, family of uh, models, which are called automata, uh, in which basically you have, uh, you have a particular state, you take an action and you go to another state, and then you take an action, you go to another state and you model this. And this is a simple, like there are only a few actions and there are only a few states you can go to. And uh, say, say you get a sequence of these actions that you've taken so far. So think like one example could be uh, you're driving a car around, a, uh, say around a round, uh, roundabout, and there are two actions that you have. You can either go forward or you can flip your car around, which is probably not possible practically, but imagine it for that instance. Yeah. And I just tell you like a sequence of these actions that, okay, I went forward, then I flipped, then I went forward, then I flipped. And I, at the end, I ask you, where are you now? 
in this uh, in this um, you know this roundabout and now for you to like think about this task you'll be like you'll reason okay this is how okay this is the action that happened if i trace the whole path i would be here right yeah. so this kind of uh, we we've, we've taken this kind of a problem uh, in a more general sense and seen how transformers uh, reason about this how can they actually predict and they do really well and their reasonings are very different they take uh, what we observed was they take shortcuts they don't actually do this computation the way we are uh, doing it they find shortcuts on how to do this and you can actually quantify this uh, theoretically like how they can find shortcuts so uh, one thing is good that shortcuts they can solve the problem, but there there are problems with that because then they can't generalize uh, outside. Uh, you know, if I give a longer sequence, they were trained on these smaller sequences and they did good on finding shortcuts there, but they might not do really well after. So these are like some uh, ways of trying to understand that. Uh, but yeah, there's there's a lot lot more. This is just the flavor of uh, something that I'm trying to understand in this reasoning space. Uh, but generally, understanding how they're doing reasoning is a very very interesting question and further improving their capability to reason would be very useful. And just to follow up to that ex example that you mentioned about the roundabout. So in that case, like in parallel to what you did. So would it also make a lot of difference on the, like in that case, you gave me some examples, right? Like I can, I can either keep on driving straight versus right or left. So those were the intermediate points that you would have like a, uh, you know, like hook to those points as in like, what were the decision-making criteria for those? So I, I assume in your work that you did for transformers, you would also define certain kind of states in between, right? So would it also matter like what states you are defining for that particular framework to reason would also vary a lot right like the results that you get you said like transformers are taking shortcuts but it could be the case that the states are not well defined or maybe not properly defined would that matter a lot in that kind of work or i'm, I'm just curious like just a pro probing question. Yeah, so in our work we kind of started with assuming that there is a uh there's an there is a state uh, action uh table that this if you perform this you will go to this state and this action it's just that the model did not ever get access to that the model only saw actions and saw that what was the state that it reached and so now it had to learn this model of uh, how the world is so this is an example of imagine that, you know, there is some model of the world, uh, think in reinforcement learning, you assume that there's some model of the world and you're trying to understand this model of the world. And we were able to find that transformers are able to understand the model of this world. It's just not the way that we would probably do it. Uh, they're doing it in their own uh, way, uh, which is uh, maybe sometimes we also find shortcuts, but that's kind of uh, what uh, we were trying to do. So we, in, the, in that setting, we, we were in a very limited setting where we assumed there was a true model to start with. And then we saw what transformers were learning. And there's a lot of questions there that maybe, you know, we can interpret like what kind of solutions they've learned, uh, understand that are, are they actually learning, learn, learning the shortcuts that we think they're learning or they're learning something more interesting. And something very fascinating uh, there in that research that uh, surprised me was that we came up with a solution. Uh, we came up with a setup where we thought the transformers would not be able to work ever. We thought that this is too hard for it to do a shortcut solution for, and it found a shortcut solution. And we were very surprised that we couldn't find a shortcut solution for that. And then uh, we were like, we kind of uh, backtracked, like try to understand what the transformer is learning. And that helped us figure out what the solution was. So in, in some sense, the transformer taught us uh, something new. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are the kind of things I think that uh, excites most of the people. And I think in the bigger picture, I think when the first AlphaGo or which, whichever uh, the game, like the Go-based uh, model that came out, uh, like if people were trying to reason like what 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 the, each of the moves meant like. So most of the moves did not make sense to any Go player, which uh, like he or she might take at that particular instance. But it was trying to understand the longer game of the other person's playing the model so yeah that was like these these yeah. are the kind of insights that really trigger us and makes us worried about like me being a person who works on these kind of models at times i feel yeah these are not dangerous but when i see these kind of insights i get like why the media articles and other things when people hype up the idea that is ai getting dangerous or something it makes more sense like that yes why why is it becoming more smarter than what it has been designed to so, but like coming to that question and I'll, I'll, I'll tie this particular thread into the next question is precisely like the most triggering question that I can ask anyone on this show is we always see these media articles, like people getting, like there are two kinds of people who would typically post articles whenever something new AI systems comes out is like one that is appreciating. And then there are 10 other articles that says, should we be worried about AI because it's trying to do something that we cannot comprehend or we cannot understand. So I want to know, and I'll, I'll tie in again a few other articles that says uh, AI along the lines of AGI versus consciousness, uh, sentient AI, if you remember, I think maybe a year back or so. So these kind of claims. And you being working on the theoretical standpoint, 
do you ever think like do you ever think about these topics concretely like does it really make sense on we are progressing towards agi consciousness and all those kind of things or are these very loosely defined philosophical or psychological terms that has little to do with uh, technical frameworks yeah so this is a this is a tough question to answer because this is completely opinion based right uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, uh, these models are doing like really exciting things and really great things. And, uh, you know, like you said, uh, with Go, they had came up with strategies that were not very human like. And I think that that creates a fear in humans when they don't understand from their mental model why uh, models are behaving the way they do. And there's no reason for these models to behave uh, in a way that is human like because you're just training them on you know, this is the input, this is the output we want, this is what the task needs to be done. You're not ever saying that be like a human when you're training this task. Not, not that there are some models which are trying to do imitation more of human behavior. So yeah, definitely it can be scary because sometimes, uh, you know, you read, some articles are actually very real, right? Like uh, if uh, the Tesla, for instance, like there are some crashes that are very evident that they were like mistakes that a human would never make, but the AI made, right? Yeah. Whereas the AI might not have made a mistake on something that a human would have made, uh, for sure. But these things are scary because you know we're, we're actually uh, this this technology is so accessible uh, right now like say chat gpt we all can access it which is this is really powerful like i was surprised my dad actually spent an entire day talking to chat gpt so <laughs> this has reached that much that you know your uh, people who are not always active on uh, these fronts are actually using this technology same with true with dali for instance like everybody was generating uh, images and it's become very accessible so of course this worry surely comes in that the more powerful these uh, systems get uh, the more impact they can have in our uh, society right like and uh, they need to be um, you know we need to really have some guardrails around uh, what is uh, feasible what is not and uh, we don't clearly we don't really understand everything it's doing and sometimes it produces results that are not um, not good now saying whether it's conscious or not is a very uh, statement that i cannot make uh, this is uh, this is very hard to say but it is really getting what i would say is getting really good at many tasks and i it's not clear like in the next 15 years what are the tasks that it might not be able to do and that doesn't mean it has consciousness but it just means that it can do a lot of tasks that human humans can do and at that point, we we all have to think about what that world looks like and how how uh, we deal with it. With any technology that is so new, like even when the internet came out, like it changed the whole uh, uh, societal fabric, right? And so this this will also do that. And um, I think we have wonderful people who are trying to think about from all different fields. We need like sciences, we need um, social sciences to actually think about what the repercussions of uh, these things are. And it's really important for any technology to think about what the repercussions of the technology are and have uh, these discussions and these debates and figure out what. And this requires like maybe policy, requires uh, um, other aspects of uh, things that I'm not an expert on. And there are many people who are better experts on these uh, to figure out how we'll keep this uh, technology, how will we keep it being useful for humans instead of like agnostic to humans or like, I, I mean, not agnostic, adversarial to humans. So yeah, I think I, I'm personally for me, I'm very excited about all these uh, new advances that are coming about because suddenly the opportunity is so huge of what we can do and how we can help uh, so many people. Like one of the examples that I'm really since I'm teach, I started teaching for the first time uh, this semester, like the power of these models, if they were actually very accurate as good teachers to places where we don't have resources, uh, could like actually, you know, share knowledge. And like, there's like a lot of positive potential of uh, these models. Uh, communi yeah. Communicating could like really help uh, in, could change the whole landscape of education where you're not searching for Google for questions and <laughs> hoping you'll get an answer. Instead, you can have an interactive conversation and, you know, discuss where you are not understanding and these models can actually help you uh, with that. And that kind of power is, it's very powerful. But yeah, we have to play with fire, really. We have to protect ourselves too. So I think uh, both sides are uh, very valid. Yeah, no, I completely agree. And I think uh, after the, before I think Dolly and ChatGPT came, even I was on the along the lines of like, maybe, yeah, regulations we need that, but like these models are pretty harmless, like because it's very hard to use, hard to train, and hence they are not very well built. But I think when Dolly and ChatGPT came, and if you follow the thread of how people have been using, creators have been using, it's very much out of control. And this is like the high time where regulations and other things have to be in place so that people uh, really can be like like you said like guardrails for these kind of models but i also do agree like like you said like uh, your father using chat gpt like one of my brothers who is uh, who has a phd in genetics like he's a brilliant guy and he's trying to learn more on the python side like he's working on genomic data so he wants to understand how i can use these logistic regression models and he has no background in computer science 
but he said like when I was, he was in chat gpt like he could train a model that he had no knowledge on using python you like scikit learn or any other kind of libraries and he was able to do that in three days so i was like wow then that's like a complete that's good impressive. use case yeah like yeah, if, so if I, you would have been github copilot for instance i think uh, a couple yeah. of uh, people i know personally who are not who are not in this ml space at all have used it and they found like their time being saving a lot of time uh, yeah. of course it's the opposite worry that the jobs are going uh, <laughs> so we have to figure out a new um, we have to we have to embrace that this is existing this is a new technology that's come in and it has its potential and we have to think of a world where we actually accept it instead of like trying to run away from it we have to accept the existence of this like how we accepted uh, google for instance at that time yeah. when google search came in like that was probably surprising for everybody so now this is yeah. surprising and we are in this new world which is exciting so we have a lot of problems to figure out but uh, yeah, I'm excited to see how people use these technologies, like especially when you give it access to people outside of the research community. Now that yeah. they are, I mean, creators are using this, they're, uh, they are creating like all kinds of uh, interesting things. I'm always surprised like when I go online and I see that they, they came up with this uh, crazy idea. I was like, when I was trying, I couldn't even think of like 100 questions <laughs> to ask that would be that exciting, the questions people are asking chat GP. So yeah. definitely it's, um, it's very exciting and scary for sure <laughs> yeah yeah but that ties to me a very student-friendly question so like um, yeah uh, an alert would be like we are done with all the technical questions so definitely i'll ask more simple simpler questions is uh one of the biggest problems that i at least i would say like we briefly started uh, in the same time but at least you started your journey in deep learning and ai slightly earlier like like you said in 2015 like i started in 2020 and one thing that i feel when you get started in this field there's a plethora of resources that people can get bombarded with and it's very easy to navigate your interest like let let, let even say finding a topic to work on like letting your interest flow into uh what has been done from the research and what you want to contribute on. So first, my first question is, do you feel uh, there is a lot amount of research being published every day, I would say now, because now I follow at least few people and they post out archive papers more than I post on Instagram. So I think like uh, it's it's very hard to keep up with good work and they're fantastic works because they have done ex extensive experiments and everything. So first of all, do you feel that? And secondly is, how do you how do you keep up? How do you make sure that you are not missing out any of the work so that like when you want to build your idea, you're citing the perfect baselines that make more sense uh, and any tips for reading these papers because it's frankly very hard to keep up. Yeah, this is a very tough question and I don't have an answer, but I'll tell you what I can do, what I do myself. <laughs> yes, def definitely there are a lot of papers. So uh, if you think about it, we have... Um... Just, just in the ML space, not even counting like uh, just core ML, not even counting like vision conferences, language conferences. We have NeurIPS, ICML, iClear, AI stats, uh, and the list goes on. And NeurIPS had uh, about 2,500 papers, if I'm not wrong. And ICML had like probably like a smaller scale and so so has iClear. And like, this is obviously not humanly possible to process all, uh, all of this data. So of course that becomes uh, trickier. Uh, so you can't you can't hope to keep up with everything that's happening in the world. So definitely that's a very big goal uh, that we probably won't achieve. Uh, but uh, I mean, in the area that you work in, you can try to be connected to the researchers that you like, whose work you you've been following. You can um, you know create uh, a network of people who are interested in same areas where you share papers and you talk about uh, you know the thing the ideas they found interesting. Like you know, if every day say say you read and read something interesting and you shared it with your friends around who were in that oh I found this paper interesting, that's gonna get them to uh, you know read that. Of course, this creates some bias that you know people who are um, who are famous their papers get circulated more, whereas uh, newer papers are harder. But uh, hopefully, you know the the right kind of work all eventually gets publicity. And you get to know that. So it is definitely a challenging uh, thing. One thing, I, I mean, for me, tools-wise, uh, Google Scholar has helped a lot. Uh, so Google Scholar gives these recommendations that have gotten better and better over time. Um, and I often find very useful papers. So somehow, like, I tested this out a little bit, that the recommendations I was getting, they're usually delayed by a week, I think. And uh, the recommendations I was getting from my collaborators and people in my network yeah. matching up pretty well. So I thought that that's a good way. And there you can follow researchers. So you can click on the researchers whose work you've liked. And whenever they post an article or their related research, you can get notification. And that helps you like, you know, so get a curated uh, uh, version. And then you can, one thing that I want, learned from one of uh, the younger students I worked with, uh, she is super organized. And every time she reads a paper, she writes down like a 
quick TLDR of that paper and uh, you know, whatever she thinks this paper connects with. And that kind of graph uh, is created where, you know, you can always go back to this graph and see uh, what all is connected. I have not gotten to do this, but I really want to do something like this. And if something we create like this, we can share, which makes people's easier to, uh, you know, navigate and add to. Uh, these things could help. Uh, but yeah, it is definitely a very challenging problem. And I think everybody's does suffers from this, that it can be very overwhelming to open archive and see a thousand mm -hmm. things, uh, and uh, very intimidating. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so you have to just create your own uh, metric of what paper you find interesting and be able to like pick out the papers and uh, spend time, uh, you know, skim reading them, then deciding, you know, you have to be very conservative about what, where you spend your energy. So you can skim read a lot of papers, just filter them out, then do a little bit deeper then filter out and uh, then do an in-depth study for a few papers uh, because it's not possible to do that for everything. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree that. And I think over the few years that I started my PhD, the way how I first read the paper has changed a lot. Like initially, I would be the person who would read the abstract and blah, blah, uh, like the very chronological Linear order way. of a paper. Yeah. But versus now, it's like for me, the other way around, like I'll see the figures first, the results that they are claiming for. And if it makes sense, like mostly I'll be reading a paper where I know the results, what it stands for. And then if the results make sense, I'll go to the abstract. Like are they really suggesting what they are uh, uh, claiming for? And yeah, apart from that, I think what you said, like totally makes sense. And uh, one addition to that, like, for me, reading groups has been like the best uh, way to get uh, updated to these works because it's very hard, like uh, at least having a close community of at least four or five people who you know, their summaries make sense to you and your summary makes sense to them. Uh, having that group really helps uh, at times and also getting updated to some of the works that I frankly would have missed or maybe I would have uh, yeah. learned like three months later and sometimes they catch these works um, so yeah yeah for your listeners I would say like if they're just starting out on this journey like it gets easier like initially it feels very overwhelming to read a paper you spend like hours and hours and days and days on a paper because you're trying to understand every little thing of that paper and then uh, slowly so you realize that you don't need to understand everything of the paper you want to understand only the idea that the paper so you should understand the problem they're addressing why they're addressing and what their solution is so as long as you understand uh, that then you can pick and choose uh, you know which papers the ideas you actually want to dive deep into and that reading over time with practice it becomes faster and faster so like by this stage you know I've seen this grow in myself also like how much time I take to read a paper to abstract out uh, what the key idea is has gotten uh, much faster also because my knowledge has increased right so this is always a, a journey another thing very creative solution that somebody has people have come up with is that they put their paper into chat gpt and ask for a summary so maybe <laughs> we'll try that yeah, actually, like a, a very funny thing happened just two days back. One of my lab mates said like he was trying to proofread a paper before sending to the advisor and he input it to the chat GPT and chat GPT to kind of summarize because that's what it's really good at, like summarizing that paper. And it, he actually used because he had an abstract of around uh, 300 words, like but the abstract had to be 250 words. So he actually used and he actually used more than 90% of what chat, chat GPT summarized because they did it so very nicely. And they actually like so chat GPT also points out a few things that it thinks that could be wrong this is what like are you trying to mean something and that was like a typo like that was like not not even like a spelling mistake but the whole definition of that word was wrong so i was like wow this is something yeah, really you, can like, use you just have to use the technology that you have in the way uh, <laughs> i use it to create my emails now uh which is uh wow. yeah i think uh yeah everybody's using it in the way that they find useful uh, but yeah, that could maybe help with the, uh, you know, summarize, summarization would be very useful to keep up with the literature. But yeah, you have to embrace the fact that you can't keep up with everything. Uh, this is the boon, or, uh, this is the course of being in a field that is very popular. But uh, it's it's really great that you're, you know, you're working in a field that is very popular because people care about what you're doing. So yeah. I think it works both ways. Yeah. Yeah. But, but talking about overwhelming and life getting easier once you get started with it. If, if 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 someone were to ask like who should do a phd like who would you think would make an ideal candidate for phd versus who should consider doing a phd like if you were to reflect back on your own self like what were the factors that you considered while enrolling yourself into phd like i'm sure you a thought would have come into your mind like should i go into a research position in the industry and then balance out my other financial factors versus the pure core love for your research so if you want to reflect back and now that you're a professor, I think it, it might have a bias for like slighting, uh, hinting, like inclining towards PhD. But if you were to reflect back on a fair point, um, who would you say makes an ideal candidate for PhD? 
Yeah, so this is this is a okay. There's no ideal candidate, right? Like uh, there is nothing. There's no one uh, one fits all uh, phenomena here. It really depends on uh, you know what kind of area you're in, what kind of interests you have, what kind of motivations you have. Uh, so I I think I think one thing that's really important is to actually know what a PhD really entails, right? Uh, which you can get from information from talking to people who are doing this or uh, you know reading. Like there are a lot of a lot of like nice accounts of you know who should do a PhD or like articles about how a PhD is like. So if that is something that you know fits with the idea of life that you want uh, and is something that you know you're really excited about and you're passionate about, uh, that's uh, that's the way uh, to figure this out. And uh, you know there are there are lots of opportunities you, there are lots of uh, questions to think about like you know financial constraints the kind of lifestyle you want the kind of uh, things you are more passionate about right like so i think uh, this really is very personal on whether you should do a phd or not um, if you if you are really excited by you know uh, the research you're reading you're like oh i want to do this research i want to we work with these people and you know then if they are in academia then that's the that's like something that you would really thrive on and it's it's also the whole phd process is not like it's always like an up it, it is always up and down, up and down. Sometimes you're very, very, you're doing really well. Sometimes you're not doing really well. And this is like a journey, which is true for every uh, job that you do. So I think, uh, yeah, so the P, the PhD experience of everybody is different. And, uh, you know, what, what whether they like it, they don't like it can also vary a lot. Uh, one, uh, I think uh, what I would say is like, if you're deciding and if you're not sure whether you want to do a PhD, um, a good idea would be to, you know, uh, read read up like who you're trying to, you know, work with, uh, read up a little bit of their work, you know, talk to their students, see what like life would look like uh, doing that PhD, see if you're actually very interested uh, in this uh, research area, are you willing to spend a lot of time thinking about problems in the space? Um, it, does that make you happy? Does, um, does that excite you? And uh, decide based on that. Because nowadays, in, at least in the field of machine learning, there's a lot of opportunity, uh, even in industry, uh, to do great work with great impact. And uh, this, there's a lot of opportunity as a researcher, to uh, like as a PhD student also, like uh, to do great work and great impact. So it really depends on uh, what what is your uh, interest. And it, it sometimes feels very overwhelming that, you know, you're committing for five years of your life. But uh, I, I will say that the PhD time is like the time that you're the most free to decide what you want to do with your time. And I think that time you don't get back. So you do suffer the cost of financial uh, choice that you make, but you also get this amazing freedom uh, to do what you want to do and figure out what you're interested in. And uh, I think that that is... Uh, a really, a really big positive. Uh, having said that, uh, there is also uh, it's it is a stressful process. Uh, everybody goes through this, uh, the stresses of uh, a PhD life, and um, you know that that is also a reality of uh, doing a PhD. Uh, and having a good support circle is always very useful for that. Yeah, I'm, and I think most of the people when I talk to like the the first reaction that I get like when I try to say to them yeah I, I enrolled you into a PhD program, most of them are scared of the commitment part rather than the other aspects of it like but being committed to one topic or one idea of uh, student life and exploring the idea of research is very intimidating uh, most of the times. But um, you, you mentioned something about like lifestyle or whatever end goal you have after doing your PhD should matter the most while deciding whether to get a PhD or not. So one question would be is um, if, if like most of the people who want to work in AI like are more interested on applying part of these AI. So if I want to get a job that heavily focuses on AI based products or AI based services. I want to get a PhD because most of the, these roles are very sophisticated. So do you think if you if the end goal is to get into an industry which is more focused on AI or machine learning or any other paradigms, is getting a PhD very uh, important, you still feel as of 2023? Or do you think, because I've seen a lot of people transition to these roles over a period of time. So you join as a whatever degree that you have, but over some point you time you work on these projects and you are later transitioned to a research scientist or a researcher. So what do you see the trend? Like, do you still see PhD to be really important? Uh, yeah. So before that, like, let me just correct. I don't think that you should have the end goal in mind, like what your life will look like after the PhD. You should obviously, uh, it's really important to enjoy the journey. So if you're not going to be excited about doing the PhD, then it's probably not the best fit because you have to do that journey. And then, then you yeah. get get so it's important to enjoy that uh, journey anything that you're doing uh, for the question about whether phd is relevant uh, for uh, is it needed uh, 
there are all examples. There are examples of people who are doing great work who have no PhDs. There are people, examples of people who are doing great work who have PhDs. And uh, there is a skill, there's a certain skill that a PhD helps you develop, which is like you're really uh, figuring out how to think of uh, what is the right problem to work on. And I'm dealing with the uncertainty of that there is no knowledge in this area. And I'm trying to push the boundaries of uh, existing knowledge uh, in this space and, uh, you know, figuring out this is the right question to ask. And this is the way that question needs to address and going through a PhD of like spending that much time, uh, in a structured way, just thinking of these kind of questions is a skill that is useful, uh, for a lot of research roles. And that's why, like, it's something that people look for in industry as well. Uh, this is of course changing a lot because the applications of uh, with with deep learning coming in, the fact that you know there's so many tutorials in the world that anybody can train a model today if they just spent uh, enough time uh, you know doing that research. So this the starting point uh, of research has become very accessible. But before that, imagine like if you were trying to do uh, research in like say a theory of uh, uh, some particular uh, part of computer science, you would need to know a lot of information that only coursework would provide you or like, you know, having gone through this whole experience would provide you. So definitely the landscape has changed. Uh, so it uh, it really depends on um, what uh, the person's interests are. If they really want to have that five five to six years of like focused energy on like just learning and uh, learning these skills and, you know, coming up with new, really pushing the knowledge, uh, then, uh, you know, PhDs, the way to go and then you can go into industry if you want after you can go into academia you have a lot of options uh or you can do the other way around i have very good very very uh good friends who have actually gone the other route who've uh, started as like you know just started as software engineers after their undergrad and then so slowly over the years today are doing research mm -hmm. with, uh, all these companies and are working on very exciting things so both paths are uh, very uh valid of course that the current time the industry is going through a um, you know, a low point where hiring and all that is not uh, that feasible, like it's really reduced. So things are changing. So we'll have to see, wait and see what industry looks like uh, in a little bit. And definitely if any area becomes very exciting, lots of people want to get into it. So there's a lot more competition. Uh, so de definitely what edge you have always helps. Yeah, yeah, no, that completely makes sense. And like, okay, like that—that that was the first point. Like, as in deciding whether to do a PhD or not. And the second spot, like, I'm—I'm I'm sure you must have gone through. And that is like my current phase in my PhD is like deciding a good thesis point. So, what were the points that you considered previously, but now looking back, uh, once you have a thesis, uh, you obviously went through the job interviews in academia industry. So now, if you were to reflect back, like, what were the things that you think? makes an ideal PhD thesis, like in terms of CS job market, whether it be industry or academia, do you think like we should be focused on at least few points that most people might not be considering when we are making a uh, thesis uh, on, on our research topic? Yeah, so I think uh, how the process really works is usually in the first few years, you are working on some project ideas and a lot of maybe your ideas come from your advisor or, or people around you. And then at some point you reach that, you cross that stage and now you're like uh, uh, ready to be like, uh, now I can think of the problems I want to work on. And this is like where you kind of sit and think that what is the thing that I'm interested in? And uh, then you decide like, this is the kind of area that I would want to focus on. And then you create your thesis around that. Uh, this there's no always one path like sometimes what this happens is naturally you ended up starting working in this space and you started liking that space and then that became your um, idea sometimes you change around you your interests develop you move around and you decide to uh, create a different topic maybe in your third year you could switch your topic completely that also happens so uh, an ideal thesis is uh, a little uh, challenging to say but like any anything that creates like uh, you know a, a new space of uh, new ideas it could be a new ideas it could be a new problem it could be a new uh, way of looking at a problem. It could be many uh, different things where, you know, you've, you've kind of condensed something that was not what existed before. And there is a new viewpoint that you've added that is your personal viewpoint. So after doing your PhD, you should be that expert in that particular area that you have chosen. You are the expert of that area. So a good, good PhD thesis would look like, uh, you know, this is the problem statement that I took, or this is what I did. I, why was the motivation for why I chose this? Uh, you would write that in your thesis, convince why this is an important problem, come up with what tools you came up with new tools. And then a good way would be to like, why are these tools useful? Like what, are, what else can they do in the future? So like that, if that journey exists in your research space, then that's a, that could comprise, you know, make a good PhD thesis. And 
or to know this is not all on you. Uh, you have your advisors, you have a lot of uh, people on your committee. They're all going to guide you through this process to like uh, what uh, to, you know, answer this question of what makes a good uh, PhD thesis. And they will help you uh, with that process that, you know, this part is missing in your, you know, to make a complete picture. This is something that you should think about. And then you'll add that. And uh, it's a journey of uh, doing this. Uh, for some people, this is sometimes always clear from the start that this is the problem they want to work on and this is what they want to do. So for them, that thesis becomes like a, uh, you know, linear direction. Just go go attack this problem, work as hard as yeah. it's wrong. For some people, it might be more different that they're more exploratory. They take some time and then they come up with this uh, particular formulation and then they're like, okay, this is the problem I really care about. And this is something that really inspires me and I want to work on this. And that could be uh, that. Sometimes it's also that you ended up working on a lot of things which there was some mind in your, something in your, uh, you know, latent state that you were actually going towards some direction, but you just didn't know that. And uh, mm -hmm. once you stop and you look back and you're like, okay, this is where I was going all this while. And then suddenly it becomes clear to you that this is what I was, you know, trying to achieve. And then all, all of these are uh, valid ways in which, uh, you know, your thesis can come about. Uh, but take help of everybody around you. Ask uh, or ask this. You're not alone on this journey. Every, there are a lot of people who have gone through this who can help you out. So if you're struggling with what your PhD thesis should look like, you know, take these, take the help of these resources. Yeah. And I'm curious, like, did you have any pitfalls that you would like maybe share with people that may like it is like an obvious pitfall that people can avoid that maybe you went through or maybe someone around you went through that people can avoid during like it could be either related to your like, thesis statement defining those uh, theses like you said uh, like you had that latent idea in mind but maybe to grasp it better uh, so that you can you can be on that track much more faster are any in general pitfalls towards your research journey overall that you would recommend to people yeah so i think i think okay not a pitfall but i would say some things that would be helpful so one thing that we always shy away from but it's actually useful to just like every maybe year end or at some point like decide to sit down and write uh like a style of a research statement like what kind of research are you doing uh what your goals are so sometimes when you sit and think about this you actually you know when you allocate time because sometimes what happens is you're in this rush of like i want to be productive i want to do new things i want to just work on my projects but you sometimes stop and don't think about why you're doing this right so i think it's very good and useful exercise to sit down and write this uh maybe in a more formal way like write a research statement because it's any way be useful for you when you apply for fellowships you apply for jobs you need a research statement so uh you know writing that down uh it, it is very a very uh, you know scary to get yourself to do that but it's actually a very useful exercise because it helps you recollect your thoughts and uh, doing that uh, you know periodically maybe not every year maybe every few years but like uh, doing that is very useful to like you know make a sense of what you've been doing and like think about what is the next thing you want to do and be more uh, you know, deliberate and intentional about what you're going to work on. So I think that is uh, something very useful. And the other thing uh, generally is useful is to go talk to people. I think you're always uh, somehow like I had this uh, thing that I had, I had a really strong imposter syndrome when I was starting out. And I was like, not confident, like, you know, I can't go to somebody and talk to them, because what will I say to them? What will I tell them that, you know, they don't know, and maybe I won't know anything interesting to say, but that's not true. You know, you always have something interesting to say, because they don't know what you know. And you don't know what they know. So it's always uh, useful. So, you know, doing that is very important. So going and talking about your ideas, talking about what you're doing, asking what they are doing, like it's always useful to like expand your knowledge. And when you tell, when you talk about your idea to somebody else, you're actually condensing and creating like, you know, the elevator pitch of your idea. And that helps you with a lot of clarity in, you know, coming up with your what, what is that I'm working on, you know? Uh, so when you're talking to your collaborators, you are like, they all understand that problem. But when you talk to somebody new, you have to explain that problem. So that and giving talks and all these things is always very useful to condense uh, the ideas. So I think I would just recommend you to take all opportunities. Uh, every opportunity that you miss is a missed opportunity that you could have taken. So take as many as you can and create them for yourself. Yeah, no, I mean, I'll, I'll just add to both of these points because I, I love these two points. The first thing that you mentioned is like maybe journaling, like this is like maybe I personally do journaling for my other personal aspects, but like what you suggested was journaling for your research statement. And it kind of makes more sense because I think few semesters back, like uh, at least in ASU, what we have over here is like every semester, if you're taking research credits, you have to like fill out a different form to get these credits. And there is a justification form of around, I think 300 words or something like that. So where you have to, 
say what is your end goal for taking these research credits and in a way that professor would say that okay type down whatever things you want to focus on your thesis and do that but it is more like a very f uh, formal requirement we don't really focus a lot on that particular research statement but still like in some ways professors try to politely say that please fill out as much as accurate possible and I think few few semesters back, uh, when I was writing the new one, I, I just got the template from the old one because we are just trying to change a few things. And I realized there were a lot of things that I proposed, but I never did work on them. And that was the time I realized, okay. And then I collected all my past six semesters, these research statements as in like, what did I start with? Because it's very easy to forget in the last two years, what was my first goal when I started working with this professor on, or, or this project, how it got evolved because it changes very quickly, right? Like, because if the results don't make sense, we pivot to a different topic. So yeah, it, it kind of makes a lot of sense what you said, like journaling uh, at some periodic time. It can help you get a better trajectory and overview perspective. And the second part you mentioned networking. I mean, yeah, I, I like at least I have been doing this, like at least these uh, podcasts itself have, have helped me a lot because talking to people from uh, NLP domains, reinforcement learning, managerial roles, program manager, um, these other kind of people who are directly or indirectly working on AI problems, it has influence. And the biggest influence that I, I think I had is uh, back in COVID when I started my PhD because of these um, podcast that I had, like some someone from the physics department reached out to me because they wanted to implement a CNN based model for detecting like tissue damage. And he was from biophysics domain. So he had literally no knowledge of working on these projects. And we eventually did that. So we we implemented a ResNet based uh, segmenting model. It was very easy for me. But when I was talking to him, like the way he was collecting these uh, problems at uh, like uh, histopathological slides and all those kind of things. He was actually mentioning like he he was a great friend to me. So he would mention each and everything like how these factors change, how these videos like th th this was like a time series data, and that helped me develop my current data that I'm working on for anomaly detection because it has been in indirectly helping me as in understanding what exactly should I segment like if, if we just use the normal segmentation model that we normally do like outlining the idea and the main object it does not make sense from at least that application point because we want to focus on other things and the anomalies can vary because the the shape of these things uh, change a lot and his domain knowledge helped me get a better idea over here so yeah sorry that for the great. long plug but as in <laughs> like just adding to those things like networking to people and talking to different from people from different domains helps the best I think yeah, being yeah. In one I field. Think university being in a university is so stimulating for that because there are so many people like in any area that you can think of in the on campus that are doing exciting work right and yeah. uh, there are so many ways to like bridge and like talk to people outside of your area and you know you can learn something very useful and for sure that this this is the experience you were talking about I think all of us have experienced some version of this where we, you know we had a random conversation with somebody and that like really opened up uh, this avenue of like new research for you or like just a new way of thinking about all the problems uh, you you were thinking about so I, I really love doing this like I love talking to people about the problem I'm working on and I love hearing their perspective because the immediate reaction they have sometimes they'll connect with something they have seen and yeah. or they you know I or I they will tell me a problem I'll connect it with something and that this really helps like this is how collaborations also start right so it's yeah. always uh, useful to like um, you know just go I sometimes just ask questions if you don't know you don't have anything to say ask them about what they are doing just yeah, uh, yeah. um <laughs> And actually, um, that's just to plug in, like uh, you mentioned about my Learning Theory Alliance uh, work. So we have on our website uh, a page called, uh, it's a resources. So if you go to letall.com, um, can, you can plug in the link. Yeah. Uh, you can go on the resources and there are a bunch of presentations. And we did networking as one of the topics. Uh, so it has like some tips from people in, uh, you know, successful people in academia who have given their tips on how they went through and how did they do networking and even tips on applying for a PhD and, uh, you know, all kinds of resources that are, they are specific to more uh, learning theory community, but actually more, most of the tips are pretty general. Uh, there are also talk, mm -hmm. tips about uh, writing research statements, uh, you know, uh, being a successful PhD student. There's something about how to keep a track of papers also, or reading papers, there's a, there's a um, you know, some resources on that. So I would recommend like checking them out. Uh, there are a lot of resources outside of what we have there available all uh, over the internet so like you know whatever you need just search you will find some resources 
yeah no i'm i'm definitely going to plug that uh, thing over here so yeah for anyone who's i i think i went through uh, like when we when we first connected i went through all of these resources and there are fantastic like i downloaded at least few of them on my local disk over here and i'm going to look through like at least i think I, there was one presentation i'm forgetting the uh, the presenter or something but i downloaded the presentation and on my flight to india like i was reading that particular thing so yeah it's a great resource for sure so i'm i'm going to plug that in for anyone and since most of the audience i have is like people who are interested in research and being like they, they are young students so it would be very useful yeah definitely so, there are some uh, that are targeted for undergrads and there are some targeted for uh, phd students and postdocs so there's like all kinds of resources uh, so you should be able to find uh, something that's useful and you know you can also suggest us uh, some topics that you think we have not covered and we can add that as like our next workshop yeah yeah definitely and uh, coming to the other topic is like one of the other scary parts for us as researchers is like what happens once we have done our stuff either as a masters or phd student is the job interviews right so like can you shed more light on because this is something lesser known because it's very well known if you are like into the common trajectory path of doing software development people know what to expect what levels of difficulties there's a whole repository of questions that you can refer for your training and all those things but after doing a phd it's very lesser known what exactly would the interview process look like like what exactly does a machine learning scientist in uh, engineer interview something looks like or maybe a research scientist at xyz company looks like so i'm not sure if you went through like the industry based job interview process or academia or whichever you went through can you share more insights what you should have in your portfolio apart from your resume what should you be prepared for Yeah so this varies a lot depending on which company uh, you're applying to or if you're in industry versus academia so i only have experience with the uh... uh microsoft research where i applied for a postdoc and then i did academic uh, job applications during my phd i did internships at uh, google so i have a little bit of an idea of uh, how that works uh, so let me talk about industry uh, first so many companies only ask for your cv um and they don't ask for anything else and then you're supposed to like go through the programming interviews and then a lot of interviews that are more re- on research and uh they can be of different flavors sometimes they can be technical on the topic that you know you are supposed to be you know an expert on so they can be very technical interviews so preparing for that is like knowing you know your backgrounds and your basic uh uh stuff so that that has like you know every different company has a different uh, uh protocol and usually the recruiter shares this with you so you have an idea of what you're going to expect uh, uh later uh for the specific companies that i uh, so microsoft research for instance is more like acad- uh, like an academic job so it's very much like academic uh, interviews how it works is you apply you submit your uh, cv you submit your research statement and you submit uh, letters of recommendation so you need to submit about 3 or uh, more letters of recommendation and once you submit your application package some something similar is in academia uh, you have to submit in addition like a teaching statement and a diversity statement uh, these are usually what uh, package you prepare and then you submit it and then they evaluate this uh, based on all of the content you've submitted and then they invite you for an interview and uh, generally the interview process looks very much like you go visit them for a day you give a talk which is on your research uh, so you this is called the job talk generally so you prepare this for to be a broad audience talk which means that you want everybody to understand this uh, talk that you have um, and you talk about you know uh, what you have done and what you're going to do in the future because they're hiring you for what you're going to do in the future because what you done yeah. what you uh, right so that's what you do and then you have like one on one meetings with the uh, different people in that so it could be in that research org or it could be in that department right so you have these meetings in these meetings they are kind of getting a sense of sometimes they'll ask you questions about your research sometimes it'll be about you know what can what is common between us and what can we uh, you know work on together if you were to come here or they would just like you know want to know more about your research area because they might be outside like say you you and I are chatting i want you were asking me questions about my research and i would ask you questions about your research because we are curious to understand what each other uh, is doing right uh so these are like usually the style of sometimes they can be more you know they they can vary like sometimes they're very friendly sometimes they can be more adversarial so it depends on uh who's interviewing you but it's it's actually a really fun experience because uh there's only very rare opportunity you get to get one on one time with uh, you know different researchers who are like doing like amazing work and this is a great opportunity that you get to actually have one on one time where they're they're there to talk about your work and this is yeah. very an opportunity to get so if you take the positive attitude towards it even if you don't get the job you get this opportunity that will always be good uh for you so uh this is more for uh, 
you know, the research and academic uh, positions. Uh, industry, of course, works uh, differently. And I might not be the best person to uh, really talk about that because I've never really had a proper, uh, outside of my postdoc, any other industry uh, job. Yeah, so... Uh, that is what I would recommend. Uh, preparing for most of these kind of, after a PhD, a lot of uh, why you're being recruited is for your work. And that is you are an expert on your work. So you just need to know your work really well and maybe uh, the related things that are happening and have a sense of what the community is doing in your space. So not just being focused entirely on your work, but like also in the broader community, what other things people are doing. Because these these are useful things to know because generally like the people you're going to be meeting or have uh, some idea of what the community is doing. And if you have an idea, then this conversation becomes a lot easier. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, like once you're pitching your expertise area, like having an understanding of the whole landscape of that area makes more sense or appealing to when you are pitching yourself as a researcher rather than just talking about your own three or four works that you have done and published, it would not make more sense. So like having a very uh, broad understanding of that landscape, what are the challenges, what are the good things, bad things and the future directions would make a lot more sense. So yeah, that yeah. So it's always it's a it's a really fun conversation. I think uh, it interview always makes it sound scary, uh, but you know, uh, yeah, they are evaluating you, but they are also trying to get to know you. So it's always because uh, they they would want to hire you, right? Uh, maybe they decide not to, but like they are trying to. So they are trying to explore as much what information they can get to decide uh, to make this decision. Uh, yeah. yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Um, but yeah, apart from that, like, I think um, these are the only things that I had, like, apart from that, I guess I just have one last question is, um, in general, so if you were to recommend people uh, any tips, so if, if he or she is into research, what would be the general tips that you would give to any researcher? Like, I will, I'll, I'll keep it to computer science, but if even if you want to have any broad tips, that would be more than enough. Because we often find, like, as students, we are always trying to opti optimize some metric, right? Like, as a student, like, if you're in a in a master's or bachelor's degree, yet our, our metric is to optimize for CGP or something like that. Versus in research, it's obviously these kind of very like, I mean, you being a professor, it might not make uh, more sense now, but as in like when we started off this PhD, our goal is to get as many paper, as many number of citations and some kind of these metrics, which might not have any relevance in the real world, but we still tend to optimize for these things. Like I want to have more citations and uh, other kind of, like, I, I don't know if that makes any real sense or not, but these kind of things we try to focus on and rather than focusing on actual work or actual research, fundamental research. So do you have any tips along these lines what should be the end goal? Like, I mean, some kind, I know that there could be some Zen motivation coming from you over in these topics, but feel yeah. free to give that, like as in what should be the end goal that we should be focused on? Yeah, so I, I'll probably reiterate what I said that, uh, you know, you should enjoy the journey. Uh, so, you know, you can get to a destination, but if you didn't enjoy the journey, then that destination will not feel good either. So even if you like, uh, you know, you spend all your time in your PhD worrying about how many papers and how many citations you got. And when you get them, you'd be like, okay, wh what did I do in the last five years? Why was I like stressing so much about it? Uh, you know, I didn't really enjoy what I was doing. And then you would have this existential crisis of like, why did I do what I did? So instead, like, it's better to like always optimize on enjoying uh, your journey, uh, learning more, uh, you know it's being in the moment is very important. I think you appreciate it. It's very easy to say for me right now, even right now, even I struggle with all these questions, right? Like I'm starting a new position. I'm like wondering about how many things I need to be trying to do and what should I be good at? And like, this is always a struggle with yourself. Uh, but but don't forget to enjoy uh, the part that you are doing because later you'll, you'll look back and you'll only remember the parts that you had fun while you were doing this. You won't remember anything else. So uh, definitely enjoy um, uh, your journey. Uh, Spend time on things that actually make you, you know, you you know what makes you curious, you know, take that time out. Maybe it'll, it'll hamper your productivity a little bit, but that time that you spend on learning something new might actually help you benefit you later in life that you don't really know because in short sightedness might not help. Like, you know, you're spending a huge chunk of your time. So think about a long-term uh, benefit or whatever you're learning right now, because that time is very hard to get again. You only get busier as you grow uh, uh, through this uh, journey. So spend time on that. And be okay and nice to yourself because failure is a very important part you have to get used to as a PhD uh, student or as a researcher because you do fail. Mostly, often 90% of your ideas don't work. It's the 10% that work. 
so you have to be okay with failure and failure is just a sign that you can improve and you can do uh, you you know the next thing is what you can do so i think that being kinder to yourself on failures and not being able to achieve the goals that you set for yourself this happens you have to be kinder to yourself uh, about these and you know keep your uh, momentum that you know you're still doing well can remind yourself what the good things you've been doing and not you know like put all your energy into the one thing that you didn't achieve so i think that's very important and um, what helped me do this uh, during my phd because i also had like very low moments where i was like why well, i'm not doing anything good and i wasn't used to failure because i didn't, before that time in my life i had not actually experienced real failure which is very lucky for me but uh, at you know now i was like okay i'm not able to do certain things and i'm this is all very overwhelming and new and what really helps is like having you know the support circle around you so invest in that support circle be there for your friends uh, who are peers who are going through this process and uh, let them be there for you when you need them and i think these the benefit of this is if you stay in this academic sphere these are the peers you will interact with for the rest of your life because they'll be in the circles that you are so all this having that uh, support circle is very important and you know taking all the resources talking to all the mentors that you have whenever you struggle having you know reaching out that you're not the only one who's struggling everybody struggles so reaching out and all that that is pretty useful it's easy to say, say now in that moment it feels very hard to do but like you know pushing yourself to do it is uh, very important and outside that i said networking is very important um, being okay to you know talk to people reach out and put yourself out there even if it sometimes doesn't work out doesn't matter because if the days it works out it'll give you such a big boost that will cover up for everything that it didn't work out on and uh, you know just just take the opportunities that you can get and create them for yourself yeah i mean yeah there's a lot to pack in but i think the these all of these things definitely make sense so yeah thanks thanks a lot for sharing these things and one question i actually had like i had which we uh, forgot to cover is like i think your transition to being a professor like what was what was your thought process i think we we did cover like the decision making process before going into phd i think that's also a big one like what was the factors that you considered not going for a research job in industry even though i think there's an obvious pay gap that we already know like academia versus industry so considering all these factors like what was what were the factors that you considered becoming a professor yeah yeah so this was not uh, i mean it's always a challenging decision to make you know because you're making a big decision which will affect the rest of uh, a large large part of your life so of course i thought a lot about it um and um, i i enjoyed my experience in uh, the industry lab as well because i spent uh, two and a half years at microsoft research which was great uh, but something that i really uh, felt like i missed out and which i really enjoyed was interactions with students and you know like having a role uh, having that energy around you and having a role in like you know maybe improving their lives in some form or the other that kind of satisfaction was very uh, important for me and somehow like that uh, always the the best parts of the job i liked at uh, microsoft research was also interacting with uh, the interns um of course my of, of my colleagues were amazing and i loved interacting with them but the students just like that that was just really exciting for me and i was like if this is what makes me very happy then academic uh, job is what i want to do and uh, i have actually since i've joined that this is what i've appreciated a lot where you know my door is open sometimes students just walk in and talk to me and it's it's like really interesting and really exciting to be able to have some kind of uh, you know influence um maybe hopefully positive uh, on them and you know working with them is very exciting they have all kinds of new ideas and things that are you know sometimes uh, i've been in this field too long that i sometimes have like a set of ideas and then these somebody new is like uh, so fresh uh, so it's very exciting and uh, generally in academic uh, life like i i have so many people here in the university who are working on these exciting things and i can talk to people outside in different departments who are doing really cool things and i feel like i uh, i can now you know i have the opportunity to expand and do like really cool things with uh, people around in this uh, space so it's uh, that's kind of what my motivation is uh, to be here and uh, maybe you know in a couple of years i will have like a better perspective <laughs> i just started so i have just done this for like a month and a half so far yeah i mean that makes that makes complete sense and i think frankly from even from my perspective like when i when i joined psc program i was the least person who would ever say that i want to become a professor but half year into my uh, curriculum as a psc student i'm much more inclined becoming in like going in the academia i'm not sure about the other trade offs that might factor in when i actually apply for these jobs but i definitely find more interesting like as in like the the uh, like the mental tussle that you have working on these problems are much more rewarding rather than getting uh, like working in industry of course they are working on fantastic projects but the idea of like brainstorming with different groups like collaborating with so many people 
from different institutes, universities, and like nonprofit organizations that make it more interesting. And the idea of writing grants and the whole academic game is really interesting, like much more rewarding uh, in terms of the thought process. So yeah, like yeah, yeah I think uh, yeah, all of this is like there are many factors that come into it. Like you said, like when you're making this decision, there's a lot of factors that come in, and everybody has their own taste. So nobody should feel pressure to do either this or that, whatever uh, they like. But uh, yeah, both jobs have like their perks, and both jobs yeah. have their uh, challenges. Uh, yeah, you got to choose what challenges you're okay with. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fair enough. I hope you yeah. uh, do join academia and uh, you continue to do this uh, great work of recording these podcasts and uh, making many people come into our academic uh, spheres. Yeah, yeah. I mean, th th that's my aim too, but I'm not sure if I'm cut out for a, being a professor or academic. I don't I don't feel I have the traits to becoming that kind of person or having that much motivation. Like when I see my professor at whatever age she's doing, like I don't know if I have that much motivation or energy in my life to be dedicated onto a problem and training newbies like me who are frankly much more under experienced or under trained so it's her patience I think she lives with us so <laughs> I don't know if I if I have that patience it always feels like this like I mean I even I when I was at uh, your stage I also felt like how would I be able to do all this and you know how uh, but it's kind of like the you and you take a role you fit into it like when you started your PhD you were like how will I be a PhD student I will come up with all these things it's like just a journey like everybody starts out not knowing what they're doing and they learn in the process uh, yeah, I'm I'm probably going to like, uh, I'm going to learn so many new things. I'm already learning so many new things. And uh, hopefully I'll get to that stage where, you know, my student will say this, that how does she, you know, like she, I, she can do all this and, you know, I can't do all this. And, I, and then I'll tell them that, you know, I didn't know anything when I started either. So, yeah. yeah so you can totally do it. Like just believe in yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll keep that word for sure. But yeah, uh, on that note, I think those were the questions I had. So I think we get to cover from a very uh, background perspective of your interest in AI to I think what your current work has been. And it, like, I think uh, even like even a separate podcast on that would be something too much uh, as in uh, we can dip, uh, dig much more deeper onto those topics but it was good to cover i think the theoretical aspects what it means and what do uh some of the works on transformers and other latest trending uh architectures have been doing and also some great insights on student life graduate life which is very useful at least to me i'm uh, i'm sure, sure the listeners to this particular podcast also find that interesting but i'll be linking to all the web pages that they can find information. So at, uh, at least your group and also some uh, works that you have done um, as a researcher so, so that they can get in touch with them. But apart from that, thanks. Thanks once again, being on the show. I think hopefully we'll connect more in the future for these kind of information uh, sharing sessions. But thanks for uh, being on the show and sharing your insights. Thank you so much for having me and it was really great chatting with you and wish you all the best for your PhD and uh, for this podcast as well. <laughs>